This is Spotlight, a biographical series that features people who've attained significant success in their chosen fields. Our guest today, retired PCEA Reverend Timothy Njoya, talks about his early childhood and his road to priesthood. I'm Geoffrey Mongai, hashtag Spotlight Njoya. I remember, not remember, I'm told, I was born in, on 7th April 1941. But in April 1941 is not when I was conceived. I was conceived in 1925. Uh, 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 some years, many years earlier, when my mother was the first Kikuyu woman to refuse to be circumcised. That revolutionary action, that uh, leap ahead of our time, that when, uh, uh, that's the f- my first action of being conceived. The next conception was 1936 when she got married. She met a dowry caravan coming from uh, my father's home. Nahashoni Joya, on the road, right in the middle, and stood and told the clan which was coming to bring dowry, Bare Eadiba, take all these goats and cows to Kakedo Market, settle them, and buy one goat for your man to marry. I'm not a goat to be bought. <laughs> that was another revolution. She Go, refused to be married. Dowry. She said, I'm not a goat to be bought. Go sell these goods and buy one good for your man to marry. You know, she wanted to break the marriage. But my father was so courageous that he still married her in the church, uh, despite what the Kirani thought. So it is that courage by my mother first, by scattering a dowry caravan. And then my father marrying her, despite telling him go and buy a go- marry a good. <laughs> that, uh, that's how I was conceived. But anyway, delivered later <laughs> in 1941 when I was born. So I was born in 1941, and I say, as 80% my mom, uh, 18% cosmopolitan, meaning Kenyan, and 2% Kikuyu. The to, first Kikuyu woman to, to refuse to be to circumcised. To be circumcised in 1925. And then it was a very important rite of passage and for the second most, men and women. And the second most important rite of passage for a woman which is not counted to, to her credit, it's dowry. You see, you say f- four your relations, your relations to a woman. I did, 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 did four. And to one woman, five. A woman, four, because she said a relation for being born uh, to celebrate where she's coming from, uh, for being given a second birth, which is called Goshi Aruna, born again, for being circumcised, and for death. That's four. Because she will live when they have uh, again when her time to be to visit the world finishes. But for a man, there are five relations because it, he gets those women four, and he gets another one of being the one who marries the woman and pays the dowry. So that a woman is does not marry. It is she is bought. You get right, me. Right. But a man marries a woman, so he gets five relations. So my mother deprived my father. Of the, of, the <laughs> of the fourth relations of paying, paying dowry. So they were equal. They had each four relations. Based on that background, mm-hmm. do you know how they related going forward as husband and wife? Oh, they loved each other. So that when my mother died in 1950, I was barely nine years. My, mother, my father couldn't marry again because he couldn't... Uh, Get some. He was looking for somebody to replace my mother, and he didn't get. She was irreplaceable. She died when you were barely nine years old. She taught me the mathematical table. It is her who taught me the alphabet. And I remember my father would pinch me on the thighs if my mother told me to say the alphabet tomorrow, and I couldn't say the whole of it. So the f- the first memory I remember about my life in my home is that I learned the alphabet. For me, I started school in Saturday three. I had already been, my mother was a teacher, my father was a teacher. There were classmates from started one to when they finished teacher training at Tumtumu. So they knew each other very well. And some Christians wrong, like I don't make you fish as a man. They taught me to pray. In fact, the greatest battle I know with my parents is I, if, I was, if I didn't say thank you, if I didn't say sorry, if I didn't say please, if I want something, and if... I didn't cry if I needed to cry. They, they, they told me, you must, you must cry when you make a mistake. That kind of discipline, I was born in very strict. 
So by the time my mother died in 1950, I could be my own mother. I didn't need a mother. I had four siblings. My sister who is older, a sister who is younger, and two brothers. So we went to stay with our grandmother. And therefore, we became our own mothers and our own fathers. And we got better and we had better education than the people with the actual mothers and fathers because of the discipline we had received from my parents. Scholarly discipline. I don't know anybody of my age in my village or even in my division, even district, who got my, a PhD before me, you know, even though I didn't grow with the parents. Did you set out deliberately to become a man of the cloth? You see, it was not my problem. My problem, the problem was, there had three problems. The first problem was, um, I was, I didn't ask to be born. So it's that my my parents to pray or to praise. <laughs> then I didn't ask to be saved. One day I was looking after my grandmother's cattle, my father, my grandfather. My grandfather had more goods than anybody that I knew in my time. Uh, except to Abogo Amadagani, who was the chief. He had so many, because he was a good trader. So I used to look after them. After school one day, I was looking after them and a teacher came and asked me, uh, Morere, that's my name. I called Timothy Morere Joya. Joya is my father's name. He asked me, Morere, when are you going to be saved? I said, oh, on Saturday. <laughs> that is the, so I got saved, <laughs> not by choice, but by grace. Just because I said on Saturday. I don't know how it came on Saturday. I went to a revival meeting. I got saved. And that transformed my life. It changed my direction. To the case that it's when I started realizing people are oppressed, they are poor. I read Matthew and Luke, and that uh, I was hungry, you did not come to see me. I was in, the, you did not feed me. I was in hospital, you did not come to see me. I was sick, you did, I was in that. prison and all that. Mm -hmm. And I found so divine rights are human rights. What is should be human rights? God is calling them His own rights. He was not the one who was fed or who was clothed when you cross the poor. He was you cross the poor, you cross, you feed the hungry, and God feels he is fed. I thought, ah, so what is we call human is all divine. Right. So that's when my salvation became radicalized. When I started reading the Bible, not only radicalized, that's when I became purely like my mother. Uh, Eight percent radical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ready <laughs> to overturn evil. Right. Yes. You saw evil everywhere you turned? Oh, in um, the school, my I was chased away. Mm -hmm. The first conflict with the authority was in the village. When I came from Karatina, where I got saved in the market, I, I organized prayers. And the headman, it was during the emergency, and people needed license for gatherings. So I started gathering people without license, and I was arrested, beaten with the size of bats. I didn't mind being beaten to propagate the gospel. So that uh, uh, changed the village. Then uh, the other thing was the schools opened. Oh, the schools opened in September. It was during the holidays. I got saved in August, September 1956. I was 15 years. So I went to school. And this year, my, here now, you know, I'm more privileged than even my teachers. Uh, because I'm saved and courageous, and they're afraid of emergency, and I'm af not afraid. <laughs> so I had the privilege of being liberated and being free from the shackles of fear. So when we went to school, I w we were to be punished for making noise in the classroom, in mass. And when we were told to go outside and be caned in line, I said, no, 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 no. I told the, the teacher, I'm not going to tell you his name. I'm not going to be beaten because, and, uh, because it's not me who made the noise. Uh, you cannot punish me for sins I didn't commit. Jesus paid for my sins on the cross. You told the teacher that? Yeah, I told Jesus paid for my sins on the cross on Calvary. So you cannot beat me for other people's sins. I know who made the noise. I was asked who it is. I said I'm not a prefect. <laughs> I'm not the one in charge and responsible for other people's sins. Let them confess. I confessed in mine. You don't consider that rude, a student talking to a teacher? No, I told way. him in front of the class, mm -hmm. outside. I told him, I confess my sins and I was forgiven. Let others confess their sins, not me. They cannot be saved by me confessing their sins. <laughs> so, what shall, shall they be saved if I tell who, who, who sinned? 
It is them to say. So I was expelled. And then after a week, the teacher came for me and told me, from now onwards, we will not beat anybody uh, because of Alala's mistakes. <laughs> yeah, unless we only require the prefect to tell us because he is appointed for that purpose. So your rebellion had an effect. It was not me a rebellion. It was testimony. You know, when you get saved, you get a testimony. <laughs> <laughs> it, I was testifying to that the Lord is my Savior. I did see that as a rebellion. Uh, I saw it as simply giving my testimony. You're listening to Spotlight. Our guest today, retired Reverend Timothy Njoya, talks about his early childhood and his road to priesthood. I'm Geoffrey Mungai, hashtag Spotlight Njoya. So you came straight out of school and went to do theology. Theology. Mm -hmm. I followed the theological line because I, you see, when I got saved at the same time simultaneously, it was like a calling to preach because when I saw my testimony is working, then I thought that is my career. Mm -hmm. And then my minister also called Waji, asked me, uh, since you are called by God, will you come for interview? You know, there are people who are being interviewed for going to the theological college. Then I went, he told me, what are you coming to do? You are already a minister. You go back to the school. Uh, uh, then Mr. Samuelish, Douglas Samuelish was the head, reverend, was the headmaster of Kagumo High School. Uh, so I told him, I also invited by uh, Charles Mohoro, you know, the presbytery of Tumtumu, for interview. He took me in his car. I was the chairman of the Christian Union. Uh, so he took me to, for interview. And the, the committee, the panel, the interview panel with the, my minister, Waji, Charles Mohoro, was an, the moderator of the presidency. They saw me, they told me, what are you coming to do here? You are already a minister. Go back to school. <laughs> then I came for the national interview at the head office. That time I was given permission by school. Uh, it is the time for interview, you know, during when you are in form four. All these companies... What, they, what they, year are we talking about here? 1963. Right. They were coming to interview people. So for me, I went, I opted for church interview. And I came to here at uh, St. Andrews in Nairobi for interview, national interview. There were about 18 Europeans interviewing me. The church was led mainly by Europeans. There were only if Magogo, a politician from North Kiabu, representing That's, that president that Magogo. Uh, the late Arthur few, Magogo? Yeah. The Johnny Gatto. Chris Pas uh, mm. Charles mm. Kareri, mm. and some other person, four, three, five Africans. Mm. All the rest, about 18. I, all these, the rest were Europeans. Mm -hmm. You know, they were to interview me. And I was very rude because they asked me, you know, I was, I was going to go in there to say testimony, not to be given nonsense. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. How rude were you? <laughs> so they asked me, how come all the other people come for interview to go to the training when married? What are you going to do without marrying? Where shall you marry? I said, marriage is not a vocation. <laughs> God did not create husbands <laughs> and wives. He created human beings and I'm human. I'm coming the way God created me. They shut up. At this stage, you are in form four. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what, what kind of material, what kind of reading? Reading I was doing. Uh, you see, I was the chairman of the Christian Union. Right. And, uh, you see, Kagumo was a cosmopolitan school. Right. And uh, to lead uh, such, a, uh, such a group of boys, you know, at their most active age, sexually, everything, you, you needed to be also radical. You know, you needed to, uh, to, be, to shine. Again, I was a member of the Communist Party in, when I was in Kagumo. Right. I was a treasurer. I still have the book. It was, mm -hmm. The party was banned. Mm -hmm. And I still have the money in the post office of Kegajo because that's why I keep, used to Today. keep money. We used to receive money from Russia. Ah, okay. So you <laughs> so, read a lot of Marx, Angels, uh, Marx. and Marx. So what has happened is that uh, when we came to be uh, interviewed by Mr. Barrow, the, the CID director, the CID headquarters was where the Serena Hotel is. Right. And the, the, poli the police headquarters was... Uh, the SNSF houses are out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. NSSF. Uh, yeah. Are, uh, you see, so they came to around that area and the prison headquarters. So they came to Kagumo to interview us and they came with the, the, the director of education, Mr. Cooper. So the panel is all white uh, uh, interviewing us to know, they called me Samoturi, uh, the, who, was the chair, who was the chairman of the of the Nyaturema, which was a communist, another a cover up for a communist party. So they asked Mush, Mush, uh, Muturi, are you a member of the communist party? He said, yes. 
He was not asked the second question. He was escorted to the gate <laughs> with his pocket money. <laughs> <laughs> and he told him, I'm going to go to school. And then he went to school and he did the school certificate. He was informed for, and he became the, direct, the first African director of Shell Company. He was very brilliant. We were all very brilliant. We were like razor sharp. So again, they called him Mutuli. Mutuli was the secretary. Me, I was the treasurer. They asked, Mutuli was asked to come in. He was asked. And all the students are locked up in the dining hall. The, Mutuli was asked, are you a member of the Communist Party? He said, yes. It was escorted <laughs> all through the gate. It was my turn. And I was asked, I came in, I was asked, are you a member of the Communist Party? I said, who doesn't serve, need salvation in this world? Is it communist or capitalist? <laughs> Jesus came to save all. <laughs> I was told, to sit down. I said, I'm not going to sit down. You are too many. So I will have a lot of disadvantage when I sit down. Moreover, before I sit down, you must remove all these beards. It is sin to have beard. You know, in the revival that time, even today, it was sin in the South Korean revival for anybody to have beards. They were associated with the uh, uh, sin. So I told them, you have to shave your beard before you talk to me. <laughs> but most of... But I told the CID to shave their beard. You know, they were artificial. But most of the communists that we know, the Marxists, the angels have beards. Those people But that you know, you this is a East African revival, which I became in 1956 when I got saved. Yeah. And this is a revival which made me socialist by saying I was sick, you did not come to see me in the hospital. Right. I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was naked, you did not clothe me. That's what made me what they were calling communist. But for me, I didn't know it was communist. Right. I thought it's just being like Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. And they are a church. They sold their things. They shared things together. So I thought I was following the Bible and I was a very strong and strict biblist. So you answered honestly. You are oh. not trying to be vague. No. When you, when, when you gave that answer. No, I was not trying. I was trying to tell them that if you are saved, you would not wear the beards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you would, you would preach to all the gospel. Jesus came to save the world. Right. Of, consisting of capitalists and communists and everybody. And I imagine your interview went well after that? No, no, no. I told them now, they, they wanted to continue asking me questions. I said to them, no, I need a cup of coffee. They all had cups of tea. I need a cup of tea. So they told me, if you give me a cup of tea, I'm going to sit down. And I sat down while saying that, waiting for a cup of tea. And amazingly, I was given a cup of tea. Were you testing them or did you really need the cup of tea? It was being on the offensive. Right. The best defense in this world is the offense. Right. <laughs> Though on the offensive, I was trying to be on the offensive. To put them, to, to shape the, the, to turn the tables. They were asking questions. I wanted also to ask them questions related to life, you know, to goodness. Like you ask me, why did I take Wagari Wamadai, a pineapple, and, and bananas yes, when I she was, you that when she was came, yeah, yeah, before he came here, yes. when she was uh, barricaded by the police. It's, it's, it's the, Jesus is the gift of the bread, of the life. He is the bread of life. So I thought, if that's what Jesus does, give life, then I must ask for a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I shouldn't be denied if these people are Christians. And <laughs> is, Well, is that the interview that resulted you now to, joining the ministry? That's what I'm going to. Right. Mr. Mitchell and Bear told me, oh, so you are a pastor. You are going to be a minister. I said, yes. <laughs> Another mistake. The first mistake when I was, is when I was asked in 1956, when are you going to be saved? I said on Saturday. Now I'm, I'm told I'm a pastor at a minister and I say yes. How can I escape that high responsibility and of being consistent and persistent? That's why I went to the theological. I, I only, when it came to form for being, filling careers in high school, I only filled one ministry, church ministry. I, right. Because there was no other thing I could do in this world. I thought, this is the God's calling. And I didn't want it. But God pestered me and pestered me until I, like Jacob. Or like Paul. You know how Paul was resisting. Right. I, I got broken that way. And I, I saw myself becoming a pastor and a theologian. That was my calling. And I always tell people who have no call or who go to the ministry as a business. You know, uh, for, 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 as an industry. And you that's see, happening a lot lately. Yeah, today you find many ministers are industrialists. They, they consider spirituality as an alternative industry because they are jobless. They can't get jobs anywhere. They it's want to make money. Well, so it's Christian, they turn, prosperity gospel. 
You mm-hmm. turn the gospel into an industry right. uh, for money, money making. Right. For us, it was sacrifice. I was giving my life. I knew that the church, and I had read somebody called Bonhoeffer, and he said the church is the only corporate association that benefits non-members. Yeah. <laughs> so the now, church is supposed to be selfless. Selfless. Right. Like it's the body of Christ. Right. So it has to be his body in reality. So that's the kind of motivation, high motivation I had to go and become a minister, to give my life, uh, to carry my own cross. And you see, I still carry the cross. On, I still hang the cross. Yes. It daggers on my chest. Right, right. Because I'm willing to die. With, when Christ calls anybody, he calls them, he calls him to die for others. So you train as... A theologian. Uh, as, as a theologian. And then uh, I posted where? I, first of my first posting as a minister was to Chuka. Chuka Meru. Chuka in Meru. Right. Uh, so I, uh, I had Shogoria, it was called Shogoria Presbytery. Right. So I learned how to, within one month, to, I had learned how to speak Kemeru, at least for preaching. People would laugh at me the first few weeks and everything. Your Kemeru wasn't very good. Uh, it was, That's why they would laugh. No, it was better because when you people laugh, it means they are hearing what you are saying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> even you want to, even you twist it for that purpose. <laughs> right. You say, they greet you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Muga, they say kaire means, kaire for them means another time, you know, second time. But you you, call, you think, you make, the, you twist as if it's a number. You say, tell you, Muga, you say, Muga gatato, you say the third time. <laughs> but it was not supposed to Number it was supposed to mean again, right? But you make it look enjoyable, right? So another language is always enjoyable when you try to speak it because you can pretend <laughs> not to <laughs> you, speak it as well as the, uh, you can pretend the speakers uh, uh, speak it as and not for them. Mm-hmm. Your your effort is identity. They feel you identify. You are trying to identify with them. You are putting effort. They think even you better than some of themselves who seem, seem to be ashamed of their own <laughs> identity. Now you are proud <laughs> to identify with them. So I said I was born uh, 18% cosmopolitan, 80% my mother and 2% Kikuyu. So I didn't have problem being cosmopolitan, meaning being Kenyan. So when I left there, then I came, I was promoted to become the minister of an all-white congregation here at St. Andrew's Church. That's from Chuka now. Now from Chuka, directly to Nairobi. How long were you at Chuka? Oh, half a year. Half a year. That, that area. So you come to St. Andrews. To St. Andrews. Predominantly white congregation. Uh, an all white, all white congregation. All white congregation. What year is this? No, there were only four Africans, but I don't think they, they, you could call them. There were only four Africans. Mr. Waruhio of the Waruhio Company. Right, the lawyer. Yes. Mm-hmm. The, the Madhu, um, Madhu of the ICDC. Mm-hmm. And uh, who else? And uh, Be- Mugo, the husband of Beth Mugo. There were only four Africans when I came there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now these are church members of uh, the church Andrews. members of a white, time, an all white congregation. An all white congregation. The, Af- the Africans were going either if they were not even African in all Saint cathedrals. They were going to Saint Al- Saint Stephen's. The, there the were no Lord. Africans in Saint Andrews. They were going to Bahati. Right. It was the African church. Right. Yeah. So I come to an all white congregation. What year is this? Nineteen sixty-seven. Right. And I worked there until 1968. So you worked for two years and go where? I went to another interim, you know, an, another transition to Dagoretti. Mm-hmm. That was in Kiabu. Mm-hmm. That, that time, the city council was not beyond the Dagoretti corner. It's the boundaries were changed later to include the Dagoretti. It was part of Kiabu that time. Right. Yeah, the, the city council boundaries have increased. So I went to South Kiabu outside Nairobi, Periaban. Then from there, I went to U.S. Upon his return to Kenya in 1976, Reverend Timothy Njoya started the PCA Pastoral Institute, the first of its kind in Africa, started by an African. Here, he embarked on teaching what he called alternative theology. It was here that his troubles with the authorities began. Next week on Spotlight. Now I started taking Moi on. Right. That was a mistake. Uh-huh. <laughs> to instead me and give me a church where there was live broadcast. 